Welcome back to our Bible study as we are making our way through the book of John. This week, we finish out the Upper Room Discourse as we are in John chapter 17. I have a couple of announcements this week. We have our spring break coming up soon. We'll take Monday, March 11th off, and we'll be back on Monday, March 18th. Also, this announcement is for those of you who are watching online but are not a member of BSF. Next year, we have a fantastic Bible study in the book of Revelation. But BSF YouTube videos might not be as accessible as they are this year. So please go to bsfinternational.org and get signed up for an in-person class or one of BSF's online discussion groups. That way you can enjoy and grow spiritually through the BSF fourfold approach to Bible study. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus modeled prayer for us. What a blessing it is to be able to reach out to you, Father, through prayer. You are never too busy or too far away from us, but you desire to hear our requests and praises through your ordained method of prayer. And we thank you for that. We pray that our prayers and our study today would be a sweet-smelling aroma to you. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get going today, history has a way of keeping alive the achievements of famous people from the past. Alexander the Great is one of these men. As you probably know, Alexander tended to name conquered cities after himself. If you had to guess, how many cities did he name after himself? What would be your guess? How about 70? At one time, there were 70 Alexandrias in the world. These 70 cities were spread throughout Macedonia, Asia Minor, the Middle East, and the Near East. That being the case, did the land of Israel have an Alexandria city? The answer is no. But why is that? Alexander and his conquering army passed through Israel on their way to conquer Egypt. What caused Alexander to resist naming a city after himself in Israel? Well, the short answer is the Bible. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, what are you talking about, Eric? The Jewish historian Josephus' historical narrative explains when Alexander was marching on Israel, the high priest petitioned God through prayer, where he was led to decorate Jerusalem, open the city gates, and have all the people dress in white and greet the Greek army. As the Greek army approached, the high priest, along with the people dressed in white, rode out to meet them. As the Greeks stopped and Alexander dismounted, he walked over to the high priest and he worshipped the name of God. According to Josephus, prior to the meeting, Alexander had seen a vision of white-clad people, the priest and the name of God engraved in gold. The high priest led Alexander and his army back to Jerusalem, where the high priest showed Alexander the ancient scroll of Daniel, where hundreds of years prior, God's word had foretold about Alexander's military domination. This pleased Alexander, and from that point on, Alexander was a friend of the Jews and allowed them to maintain their independence. This is an amazing story of how the high priest interceded for his country through prayers to God. But also, it's surprising to see a pagan world leader moved to kindness by seeing himself in Scripture. Alexander had seen himself in scripture and was deeply affected by the experience. 
which ties into our scripture this week, because we, you and I, and every believer who's put their faith in Jesus shows up in our scripture today, which should also deeply affect us. So our lesson is divided into two divisions. Division one is John chapter 17, verses 1 through 19, Jesus, the divine intercessor. And our second division is John 17, verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for us. As we get started in our first division, Jesus, the divine intercessor, please turn to John chapter 17, verse 1. We ended last week <clears throat> with Jesus saying, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We will see that Jesus doesn't depart this earth in, humi in humiliation, but instead in victory. Jesus knew this was his last night with his disciples. He was just hours away from the arrest in the garden. Let me ask you, if you knew you had less than 24 hours to live, what would you do? Who would you be with? And what would you pray for? Well, Jesus prayed after completing his upper room discourse with the disciples. He prayed for his final great work of redemption that the and that the Father and he would be glorified and for the disciples and for the future disciples. A little bit of a spoiler alert. Normally, because of time constraints, I can't read all the scripture, but since chapter 17 is one continuous prayer from Jesus, I didn't want to chop it up and omit sections of it. So today, I will read all of Jesus' prayer. I know you guys have already read it several times and you've answered your lesson questions, but I feel led to read it and not cut out sections of the prayer. Now let's turn to scripture as we start reading in verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus did a lot during his earthly ministry, but the primary purpose was to complete God's plan of redemption by dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And now the hour is here. Since Adam and Eve sinned in chapter 3 of Genesis, God promised there would be a time when the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And now that, that hour is at hand. The serpent crushing son was about to complete the father's plan of redemption for mankind. It had been a long wait, but God's timing is perfect. In verse 2, Jesus acknowledges that he has authority over all people, and he is the giver of eternal life. I know we know this, but eternal life is a gift from Jesus. It's not something we earn or deserve. In verse 3, Jesus defines eternal life by knowing the Father and understanding that the Father had sent Jesus. There's a relationship aspect to eternal life. Eternal life isn't just long life, but it's abundant, satisfying life through a relationship with the triune God. Let's turn to verse 4. I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. From this passage, it seems Jesus is looking forward to returning to his former glory, the glory he had before the creation of the world. In a simplistic way, it's like Jesus is homesick. He left heaven in all of his glory to come to a sin-filled planet that is ruled by Satan. And now he's thinking about his return. Let me ask you, do you daydream about heaven 
what it will be like, what you will look like, the conversations you will have, and so on. It's like, as Christians, we are homesick for a home that we have never been to. We long to bat, we long to be basking in the glory of heaven and to face and to be face to face with our Lord. Well, let's keep moving on to verse six. I've, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Jesus has changed the focus in the prayer from his final work on the cross to his focus on the 11 original disciples. In this section, Jesus is specifically praying for the disciples, but his prayer also has some application to all believers since that time. For instance, we believe in God's word. We're obedient to God's word, and we understand Jesus was sent from the Father. Jesus taught divine truth. He represents divine truth, and consequently, he revealed the Father to his followers. Moving on to verse 9. I pray for them, and I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is leaving, and he is leaving the disciples in a world that will be hostile to them. So Jesus makes a request to the Father to protect them by the power of God's name. Jesus proclaimed the power of the Father's name. We might not fully understand it, but there's power in God's name. Jesus also requested the Father to give the disciples unity, the same unity that the Father and Jesus share. This is the oneness that Jesus is talking about, triune unity. Moving on to verse 12. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Jesus loving, lovingly cared for and protected his disciples. And now he was turning their protection over to the Father. None were lost to the deception of Satan except one, and that was Judas. Doomed for destruction is another phrase for son of perdition, which is a Semitic expression for who is destined for damnation. Next year, when we're in the book of Revelation, we will run into another son of perdition, the Antichrist. Occasionally, I run into people who don't have a high view of Scripture. Last week, I was told that the Bible is just a useful tool. But in Jesus' prayer, in verse 12, you can see Jesus had a high view of Scripture and the prophetic fulfillment of it. At the tail end of verse 13, Jesus says something remarkable. Jesus desires for, for the disciples to have his full measure of of joy inside of them. Jesus concluded that his joy was a result of how he had lived and why he lived. And he wanted his disciples to experience this same full measure of joy. Let's keep moving on to verse 14. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. 
My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. There is a sharp distinction between the disciples and the world. What causes this sharp distinction? Well, it's Jesus and the word of God that causes the division. One group embraces it while the others hate and hate those who obey God's word. Through John's gospel, by the use of darkness and light illustrations, John has been describing a a dualistic universe where there is a cosmic battle between good and evil. God created the world and pronounced it good. Sin entered the world and brought with it evil, suffering, and death. Satan's values are directly opposed to God's ways at every level. Consequently, people cannot live in both camps simultaneously. Their reality or their truth, uh, let me rephrase that. People who prefer darkness will not tolerate anyone who threatens their reality or their truth with God's light. But as believers, Jesus didn't call us to isolate ourselves from the world, but instead, requested the Father to protect us from the evil one so that believers can move in the midst of evil while bringing the gospel to a perishing world without getting burned by the evil one. As we wrap up this division, let's read verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Sanctification for the believer has two parts to it, which makes it a little challenging to fully understand. Bible scholars would say we are positionally sanctified, which means we've been cleaned and set apart to do the work work God has for us to do. But they would also say experientially, We must be sanctified by the Holy Spirit through an ongoing process of conforming us to possess the character attributes of Jesus. In simple terms, the Holy Spirit is molding us to be more like Christ in our thoughts and actions through the power of studying the truth of God's word. As we wrap up this division, Let's talk about BSF's doctrine focus this week, which is prayer. Not surprising, right? I would say there is some confusion regarding prayer in the world. Jesus had a lot to say about prayer. In Matthew 6, Jesus told us to his followers not to pray like the pagans slash Gentiles and not to pray like the Pharisees slash hypocrites. And Matthew and Luke's gospel account contain the model prayer that Jesus gave the disciples, often called the Lord's Prayer. But in reality, it's more like the disciples' prayer. And in, the, in our scripture this week, we have Jesus' high priestly prayer, which in simple terms is more like the Lord's Prayer. So fundamentally, what is prayer? Prayer is most simply a conversation with God, talking and listening. Believers speak to God through prayer, and God speaks to believers through the Bible. Believers pray to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Trinity are active participants in prayer. Jesus is fully God and fully man and empathizes with our weaknesses. His prayer in John 17 demonstrates his love for his people. The Holy Spirit helps us pray even when we do not know how or what to say. Prayer includes more than presenting a list of requests to God. Through prayer, we praise and thank God, confess our sins, proclaim his promises, and present our needs. But... There are people who don't believe in the power of prayer, and instead, they depend upon their own efforts, plans, and 
and conclusions to obtain what they think they need to live well. When prayer becomes a last resort, they discard the opportunity to regularly align their heart to God's and actively surrender to his will. They feel and act like God is either distant, unconcerned, or powerless to impact their lives. While people who believe in prayer not only take their concerns and burdens to God, but they frequently intercede on the behalf of others by taking their burdens and concerns to God. Which leads us to our first principle, which is believers intercede for others. Believers intercede for others. Throughout the gospel accounts, we see Jesus taking time out of his day to pray to the Father. Often these prayers, Jesus was bringing others to the Father by interceding on their behalf. Jesus lived his life during his earthly ministry as an example of how we are to live out this Christian life. If it was important to Jesus to intercede for others, it should be important to us as well. Have you experienced the privilege of having someone else pray on your behalf? It's very humbling. As others empathize with your struggle and unite their spirit with yours as they take your burden before the Lord. So let me ask you, in what ways have your intercessory prayers made a difference in the lives of others? In what ways have your intercessory prayers made a difference in the lives of others? So we start our second division, Jesus Prays for Us. Please turn to verse 20. Before we get going in this division, it's always amazing to me, as we do our yearly BSF study, how timely God's Word is. And this week, chapter 17, gives us another example. As many of you are aware, there was a controversial Christian ad during the Super Bowl, which was titled, He Gets Us. Well, the He Gets Us slogan created quite a stir, and regardless if you are for it or against the ad, I think chapter 17 provides a good slogan for next year, just in case they're looking for a new one, and that is Jesus prays for us. Of course, Jesus did a lot more for us, but our focus in this section is Jesus praying for us, which is amazing because when you think about it, Jesus is perfect, which makes his prayer perfect. I started out today discussing how Alexander the Great was affected by seeing himself in scripture. Well, up on the screen now, I've highlighted all the instances where you and I and all believers who put their faith in Christ are in scripture. Twelve times believers in Jesus show up in these seven verses. Now, we don't have an invading army like Alexander, but we are in the Lord's army, and Jesus is the King of Kings. So let that sink in. The King of Kings specifically prayed for your unity, destiny, and love relationship with God. Moving on to scripture, let's start, let's start reading in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 20 points to the fact that future believers will come to Christ through the disciples' teaching, which is meant by who will believe in me through their message, which we understand this. Through the apostles' teaching is the primary way people directly or indirectly are led to believe in Jesus. Through our study this year, we've learned several times that Jesus revealed the Father to the world. And now in verse 21, Jesus is praying that through our unity with Jesus and the Father, that the unbelieving world would believe that the Father had sent Jesus. From this, one can conclude that our unity 
with the Father and Jesus needs to be visible to the unbelieving world to make an impact on their hearts. It's remarkable to think we are part of God's redemptive plan, not just for ourselves, but for others to come to Christ. Let's move on to verse 22 as we read. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. A couple of things to note. Jesus has bestowed his glory on us, believers. This is a humbling and convicting truth. As believers, we possess Jesus's glory. Talk about grace in action. But then at the end of verse 23 is even more amazing. The Father's love for us is the same as the Father's love for Jesus. Last night, I was contacted by another BSF teaching leader, and he was marveling at the fact that we have the whole Trinity dwelling inside of us. What an amazing truth about the Trinity, but also convicting and even more reason to keep your temple clean and undefiled by unconfessed sin. Trying to wrap your mind around these two verses is challenging. <laughs> Maybe one perspective is, if believers find their deepest unity by believing the message of God through the work of Jesus, believers then bear witness to the cause of their unity and thereby, and thereby bring God glory. Moving on to verse 24, let's read it. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Often you will hear people in the culture talk about someone's destiny, but have you ever thought about your destiny as a believer in Jesus? If someone asked you, what is your destiny? What would you tell them? Thankfully, Jesus clears it up for us in this verse. One day, our ultimate destiny is to be with Jesus and to see his glory, the glory he had before the world was created. Currently, we are positionally in Christ, but in the future, we will be face to face with our Lord and we will behold his glory. I'm sure we'll fall flat on our faces and we'll probably need sunglasses, but I'm looking forward to it. Moving on to the last verse of this division, let's read. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. When you read these verses, you can't help but notice Jesus' reverence for the Father, where he calls him righteous Father. I'm sure you guys are like me. It's troubling to see and hear how the world abuses the name, the name of God routinely. Let that not be said about the Christian community. May we never lose our reverence awe for God and his name. Let our actions reflect this reverence for God to the world around us. Jesus' final prayer request was for our mutual love, the same kind of love shared within the Trinity and demonstrated by the Father for sending Jesus into the world. This mutual love unites all who believe in Jesus as their Savior. Which brings us to our second principle, which is believers' unity is important to God. Believers' unity is important to God. If Christian unity is important to God, how important is it to you? Do your actions reflect that you actively seek unity with other Christians? Since we are seeking unity, let's take a minute and discuss what unity is and what it is not. Unity is not uniformity. God does not desire all Christians to look, talk, and act the same way. Unity is not universalism or ecumenicalism. A quick study of church history bears out 
the truth that God uses believers from all walks of life, different racial backgrounds, and diverse denominations to advance the kingdom of God. What is biblical unity? Here are just a few examples that unify all believers. We are unified with other believers through a common identity found in Christ. Our shared faith, we share the same fruits of the Spirit. We're unified by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and a shared mission to proclaim the gospel to a dark and dying world. At times, we can feel disconnected from other believers, especially if we attend a large church, which is why it's important to get involved at your church or a Bible study like BSF. From my experience, short-term mission trips to foreign countries is another way to experience this godly unity with other Christians that Jesus wants us to have for one another. So let me ask you, how do your prayers reflect your desire for unity with your Christian brothers and sisters? How do your prayers reflect your desire for unity with your Christian brothers and sisters? So we wrap up today. The big idea for this chapter is Jesus' heart for others. His prayer revealed his heart for the lost, the Father, and for his followers. So <clears throat> if we're being sanctified and molded to be more like Christ, then we as believers should share Jesus' same heart for others. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we desire to have a vibrant and fruitful prayer life. Help us to align our desires and passions with yours as we seek you in prayer. Tune our ears and focus our eyes so that we can hear and see your responses to our prayers. As we split off in our discussion groups, I pray for a brotherhood of unity amongst us as we discuss the scripture today. In Christ's name, amen.